I played with you for years. And I still could be out there. Where is she, Paul? She's a melody in the wind. Finally, you have me. Your savior. Serial killers have long been the subject of fascination. Well, police have arrested a suspected serial killer in Tampa. Our police in Kentucky said they've arrested a serial killer who has ties to Florida. I desensitized myself to it. I, 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 uh... He is pure evil, but you'd never know it by looking at him. To Liz Kendall, Ted Bundy was not a sadistic murderer who killed dozens of women. Mr. Ted Bundy, you've been involved in uh, how many uh, homicides? No, we came up with 30. We're fueled by the need to know their methods, the way they think, and ultimately, their motives. And with the market saturated with TV shows, documentaries, books and movies about serial killers, it leads us to the question, why do we romanticise them, and ultimately, why do we care? While some are interested in the reasons for their notoriety, one theory is that it acts as a social function, and let me elaborate on this. Any social structure which guides our social behaviours have a social function or consequence for that operation. In this case, crime acts as a social function reaffirming social norms by showing what happens when you go against the grain. With serial killers, entertainment channels facilitate a way of acting out macabre thoughts and violent fantasies without physically implementing them, but also show the consequences when justice is served. But they also serve to justify the behaviour of serial killers, so the public understand their actions. Which brings us to today's short horror. So let's get into it. A mother's love is supposed to be unconditional. Or at least, that's the way society would tell it. Psychologists would say, our relationships with our parents mould much of who and what we become much later in life. Today's film toys with the idea of nature and nurture, and whether the making of a murderer is truly choice or condition. Chimes, released in 2018, is centred around Paul a man plagued by the echoes of his abusive childhood, seeking to satiate his need for revenge by redirecting his rage on his unsuspecting victims. Victimising those who bear some semblance to his mother, Paul targets his victims in churches, where he uses his charming and seemingly friendly demeanour to manipulate vulnerable and trusting women to their eventual death. <laughs> Also, let's not pretend that Paul didn't just recycle those dead-ass flowers from his bedroom and pretend like he got her a gift. With each kill, Paul feels he's bringing salvation to his victims. Almost as if to say, you went to church and you prayed for a miracle, and you got me, babe. Stabby stabby. Paul mentions how each victim shone bright, but only for a moment. And while this may be a metaphor for the euphoria he finds in killing, it's also pretty hard to shine, if you're dead. In Paul's arrogance, he makes a crucial mistake by taking evidence to church and losing it in the pews. In an attempt to recover the shard, Paul returns to the church and it is revealed that the priest knew about Paul's escapades all along. When Paul questions why the priest never turned him in, the priest reveals that he made a vow to protect Paul and he plans to uphold that because homies don't play like that, and Padre ain't no snitch. Despite the priest's words, Paul reveals himself as the monster he really is, and murders his father figure before turning himself into the police. 
As the director, Janine Benkart, describes, Paul hands himself in because after all the fighting in his life, he finally reached a target he didn't even know he had. He felt something. He felt something as he kills the only person in his life he has emotions for. The only person that provided him with some form of security and warmth and protected him from the harm in his life. All starting with his mother. With this killing, he felt pain. An emotion he had never known before, but had longed to feel. As we see Paul tormenting his latest victim, we're introduced to Julia, a previous victim who is now afflicted by Stockholm Syndrome. Nevertheless, it is she who will continue Paul's mission once he's locked away. So with that covered, let's talk about what was good about Chimes. I think the aspect I like the most about this short is the sense of false piety and idolatry. We see seemingly religious people betraying and vitiating their witness of God and a number of different interpretations of idolatry. We have a father who betrays his oath to God to protect an irredeemable soul, costing him his life after endangering his own congregation. He's also seen wearing a non-religious hat in church, which apparently according to religious etiquette is a no-no. We have a murderer who sought his victims in churches, which is supposed to be a place of security, and used a pious image to deceive his targets while also demonstrating self-idolatry, as he claimed to be a saviour to his victims before ending their lives. I mean really, look at him praying, it was short, quick and mechanical. He had a conversation midway through it. If that's not a minimalistic devotee, I don't know what is. Combine this with a mother who seems to be a big fan of the whole spare the rod, spare the child philosophy, and you end up with a very twisted trinity. Oh, and let's not forget Mary, who's the parishioner who wanted to get her sugar wars tickled. I think in this sense, we could probably claim her to be the Mary Magdalene of the group, but I mean, you know, I know you're human, but come on, we're in church. There are elements of this movie that feel almost Shakespearean in the expression and its juxtaposition of lightness and darkness when referring to the priest versus his mother. The movie starts with an adolescent Paul hiding in the dark and singing the song Hey Mr Moon Man composed by Bernard Sexton and embedded within the lyrics are Paul's desires as well as a reflection of Julia's mental state. Shine, shine. Shine your light on me. Where are you? Here you are, you bastard. How can I ever be proud to you? going to kill you. Only the feeling of pale moonlight on my fingertips. That's what I know. The song cries for the moon to shine its light on the singer, almost as if releasing them from the prison created by being lost in the darkness. However, ironically, many spiritualists and mental health professionals believe the moon creates what they call the lunar or lunacy effect also known as the Transylvania Effect, and this is where the mythology of werewolves and vampires come from. Essentially, it brings out the monster in all of us, so it creates the question why Paul is seeking the moonlight. While there is no academic proof to provide evidence of causality, in the context of chimes, it feels like mini Paul seeks solace and finds this in the darkness, accompanied only by chimes and the blue hue of moonlight. But in adulthood, this only feeds the beast he feels his mother created. This sentiment is also echoed in Julia's actions. Here we see Julia now in a mentally fragile state with her only certainty being the moonlight and Paul. And by the end of the movie, those certainties have created a new monster forged in anger and moonlight.
The movie constantly utilizes color and lighting to emphasize many of these points and highlights his relationships with those around him, his triggers and the mood. The use of light is not just a temporal device, but also demonstrates Paul's state of mind as well as his relationships. His mother is always masked in darkness and represented by the color red, a color that is then repped by Paul's victims. Paul is always surrounded by blue, representing the blue light of the moon, and the mental state that haunts him, moulded him, and reflects his intent, and with each kill he adds a piece of blue glass to his chime, featuring his latest victim. The father is shown in the light, and acts as Paul's beacon in the darkness. As Paul kills, he flashes back and forth between being a boy hiding in the moonlight and shrouded in the fears of his sadistic mother, versus the warmth and light he feels in the father's protection. With each kill, Paul remarks that each victim shone bright for a moment, however the feeling never lasts. For a moment, all of them shone so bright, just like you. It is during the act of killing where we can see these flashbacks to a time of warmth being the moments Paul shared with the priest. However, as the light fades away, we see his flashback revert to the gloomy setting he was once familiar with as a child. It is only when Paul kills his father figure that he supposedly finds the satisfaction he desires. Prior to this realization, when Paul is frantic about the lost shard, both Paul and the father are shrouded in darkness with blue hues as Paul the monster is revealed alongside his murderous intent. But I do also have another theory as to why that might be. But we'll come back to that a little bit later. Julia, initially sported in red, is later seen in a halo of blue light and can be heard humming Hey Mr Moonman. The use of red is used well as Paul often targets women who resembles his mother and red is often a colour used to suggest aggression, danger, or a target. Which makes you wonder whether the women he targets are actually wearing red, or whether we're seeing Paul's view being imposed on the victim. Note, when Julia is presumed to still be a victim, she is seen in red. However, Paul meticulously cuts this out, almost as if suggesting that this version of Julia is no longer with us. Later, we see she's alive, but in a dishevelled state, and in a more muted and dingy blue outfit, as we can now see that her mindset is now realigned with her abductor. And finally, as a new Julia steps forward and rises to take Paul's place, she returns to red, symbolising her evil intent. In contrast, blue, which is typically a positive or calming colour, is instead depressive in this movie. It grows to show the cold and uncaring side of Paul. The overwhelming effect of the blue also creates a negative feeling of melancholy and shows the self-righteous and oppressive demeanor Paul exudes. And while the moonlight was once a form of refuge, this and the chimes have now become vessels of his rage and tools in his crimes. In isolation, Ben Cart paints a great image of what she believes a human predator to be, and she has a strong cast to help drive that. Martin O'Sullivan gives a chilling performance as Paul. I mean, I believe he will kill me. Well, not me, because you wouldn't catch my ass in a church unless I was there under duress. And even though she wasn't in many scenes, Angel Hannigan did a brilliant job as Julia, and I completely bought in to her growing madness. And to anyone who has watched my previous videos, you may recognise Martin from another short horror I've previously reviewed called Cat Calls. Ironically, he also plays Paul in that short horror, so maybe we've got kind of like a parallel universe thing going on here. Either way, I'll make sure to link it in this video and below in the description box, so make sure you go check out the review and the short horror. That aside, it's Ben Cart's interpretation of a serial killer that I was less excited about. In isolation, Benkart does well to show her portrayal of a serial killer, but on a wider spectrum, 
I don't think it demonstrates what she hoped, and it becomes quite vapid as it demonstrates the same character tropes as any other fictional or televised serial killer. During my research on this movie, I found that the director did a lot of research on the topic, so it's sad to see that the execution fell a little flat for me. Benkart wanted to create a serial killer who was highly intelligent, a manipulator, and always a step ahead of the game. And she successfully portrayed a character with many of the stereotypical traits you see in a serial killer. For instance, he's a average Joe, being your Christian white male, who's roughly about middle aged. He portrays himself as charismatic and charming. He's a narcissist with the perception of being intelligent. And he has mental health issues which supposedly contribute to his crimes, as well as being a misogynistic cipher who preys on women. And if you throw in the Stockholm Syndrome victim, that's pretty much the cherry on top. Now, that isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it does little to add to the subgenre. Benkart successfully embeds evolutionary psychology in Paul's mythologies. Paul acts as a hunter. He camouflages himself in his surroundings as he tracks his prey, predicts their behaviour, and uses it to trap them while waiting for the perfect time to attack. He creates trophies of his escapades and primarily targets strangers. However, this reflects serial killers of the 70s and 80s and less so of those that kill today. While serial killers now have to contend with advances in technology, the tenacity of the police force also has a lot to do with it. Paul has been killing for the at least five years, and in that time the police have only been able to establish that the killer targets his victims in churches. I would argue that Paul isn't necessarily intelligent, but rather the police are ineffectual. Ultimately, I feel what we see isn't intelligence, but more so arrogance. And it's this which makes me think that this is the real reason why Paul kills his father figure. When the father reveals that he always knew what Paul was doing, he seemed notably and genuinely shocked, revealing he clearly thought he was untouchable. And by his reaction, I sensed his actions were driven more by rage, and the consequent gratification he felt was incidental. He acted out of passion, he was sloppy, and he knew he messed up and this contradicts the image of the character Ben Cart is trying to portray. However, the biggest issue I had with this short is the common trope a lot of movies use when portraying serial killers, which is, a mental health disorder made me do it. Mental health issues are not causation, and it's tropes like this that somewhat reinforce prejudice towards such issues. There are definitely moments where we can see Paul being triggered and having flashbacks of his traumatic childhood. But even prior to those triggers, his evil intent is always apparent. I felt that this short placed so much emphasis on Paul's past that it completely glosses over something the priest hints at, which was, Paul made a choice. And to me, it highlights another angle which says that Paul used his past trauma as an excuse, he enjoys inflicting pain, and he's just plain evil. I think what I was hoping to see in this short is just a different approach. As I mentioned, as an isolated piece it does what it says on the tin. We were served a short about a serial killer who takes his past trauma out on church going women who remind him of his mother. But within a wider body of work, it employs all the usual tropes we see in movies of this sort. It would have been great to see something different, and there was a great opportunity in this movie. Julia was potentially the most intriguing part of this movie. I was desperate to know what she endured in her years of captivity. What was it that broke her, and what's driving her to continue Paul's work? Clearly she was exposed to Paul's history, and it would have potentially elevated everything to see the moment Paul and Julia made that connection. We often see the torment victims are subjected to, or see them as fully compliant accomplices, but it's rare that we see that pivotal moment where you see the victim snap and witness that mental shift and realignment. As Julia continues Paul's work, 
The demeanour we see displayed by Paul in the end is chilling and I can feel the evil intent behind his eyes and you can feel the same intention in Julia's eyes. Seeing Julia continue Paul's work under the guise of being dead would have been an interesting view as we see the evil evolve and being interpreted into something new and as Julia becomes the new monster that Paul has created she's potentially becoming something more dangerous than Paul anticipated. I think Jonathan Mabry sums things up nicely when writing Ghost Road Blues, stating, Evil never dies, it merely waits, and it grows stronger in the dark.